gentlemen welcome we're talking power plant in here for this session and I'm really pleased that you have made this part of your day here because I know the choice is amazing so many different sessions to sit in on so I'm really pleased that you're here I think you're going to find this fascinating and enlightening and actually very instructive as well we're talking about the relationship with nature. Uh, as Europe decarbonizes, what is that relationship with nature going to look like? I mean, obviously, we know that a sustainable world, a decarbonized world, is better. But while you are getting there, how do you ensure the, bio the biodiversity thrives? as you are moving on this journey. And when I say the biodiversity thrives, you know, it's, it's not just a case of business as usual for nature, but actually making things better. So Euroelectric has launched a guidebook on how to do this and how to do this well. Um, it actually will be officially launched during Renewable Energy Week in Brussels. It's on the 13th of June. That's, that's when it will uh, officially be available. But we wanted to take you through some of the ideas, some of the thoughts today in this session. So take a look at this. Our industry is determined to tackle the climate challenge and to look out for the environment while doing so. We have the knowledge and the tools to make sure that we can protect nature and improve biodiversity as we replace fossil fuels with clean and renewable electricity. So let's get to work. electrifying in harmony with nature. But as you saw, the idea being that it's not just in harmony, it actually enhances as well. So we will take you through the guidebook shortly, but we thought it would be really good to get the perspective from the Greek government on this. So let's widen this out now and take a political perspective. And we are absolutely delighted to have with us the Deputy Minister of Environment and Energy of Greece, ladies and gentlemen, Alexandra Stoukou. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I think it's a philosophical question to ask if this room is full of energy, if uh, all of you have good vibes. Uh, I see it and it's really amazing. Of course, I think it's the ambience here which makes it uh, more vivid. But um, let me welcome you in Athens. Uh, second day today. I know that you had uh, yesterday a fantastic and very productive uh, day with uh, a lot of discussions. Um, going now to, uh, to the topic, 
uh, which is very important and very serious. And I would like to start by um, addressing actually a pressing issue that is uh, directly, I think, uh, uh, connected to the discussions of this summit. We are currently ahead of the summer uh, season, and uh, allow me to say that here in Greece, this means one thing, better prepare, better prepare for uh, possible uh, wildfires uh, that could destroy, unfortunately, whole parts of our country. And uh, having already witnessed, I would say, months of new record temperatures uh, in spring, uh, we cannot help but uh, worry, worry about the possibility of uh, disasters that could hit us once again. Every year, our concern grows along with, uh, with this threat that is posed by these catastrophes. And uh, you know what, as, as a mother, actually, I often find myself uh, thinking, what kind of world uh, are we living for the next generation? And um, in my role as a Deputy Minister for Environment and Energy in Greece, uh, this reflection also deepens into a strategic concern how can we ensure that the policies we develop and the actions we take today are building a sustainable world uh, for our children? Uh, needless to mention that the evidence of climate change is uh, undeniable. Each year we see an accelerating decline in the species that fill our forests, oceans and skies. Each year we see this impact on both um, uh, natural and human systems. So uh, climate change obviously is leaving its mark and uh, Europe is no exception. I think the video showed everything. Europe is the fastest uh, warming continent with uh, temperatures rising at around twice the global average rate first. Second, um, heat related mortality has also increased by around 30% uh, in the past 20 years. Also, the consequences of agriculture uh, are also severe, leading to lower uh, crop yields, livestock casualties, average sea surface temperature uh, for the ocean across Europe are reaching a record as well. And uh, Europe also uh, experiences uh, fewer days of uh, snow than average, particularly across uh, Europe and the Alps. And beyond Europe, in 2023, we've also seen in the United States, China, uh, North Africa, Middle East, uh, temperatures set records, again, with deadly consequences. I don't want to recall here what happened in Canada, uh, with uh, the worst wildfire season ever, the cyclone, uh, Daniel, uh, brought rainfall that never been seen uh, before in Libya. India as well suffered with devastating uh, floods. And recently also what we saw in uh, Dubai. Now, in Greece, uh, we've also felt this uh, climate change uh, firsthand. Greece has experienced uh, prolonged heat waves, has experienced uh, droughts, and um, all these um, events uh, impact agriculture, they impact water resources. Um, Daniel had also an extreme, a very severe impact uh, on Greece, particularly affecting uh, the Thessaly region, as you know, and uh, increased frequency and intensity of wildfires, devastated forests, homes, ecosystems, posing threats to biodiversity and human settlements, which is the topic of our discussion. So what is our reaction? In Greece, uh, let me say with uh, headlines, what are the priorities? The priorities are very clear. Prevention is the first word. Taking steps to stop disasters, before they happen. Second is mitigation, so reducing the damage uh, disasters can cause. Third is response, actually 
acting quickly to protect people and property during disasters, and recovery. Recovery meaning helping communities rebuild and uh, return to a normal life after a disaster. These priorities are very central to our ministry, and uh, I would say these priorities are fully supported by the entire government. Greece is uh, committing over uh, 2 billion in the coming years, mainly from uh, European funds to improve our, our civil protection infrastructure. We have uh, the Aegis, Aegis program that will help improve disaster response and preventing environmental damage. We are investing today in new equipment such as uh, fire engines, uh, uh, firefighting planes, helicopters, drones, rescue vehicles. And um, just to support these efforts, uh, the, Greece has, uh, the Greek government has also introduced um, a new tax for tourists, uh, which is expected to generate up to uh, 300 million in uh, 2024, uh, exactly aiming at uh, recovery. But uh, let me focus on something which is actually my topic of uh, interest. A key component to uh, our prevention strategy, with, uh, which I want to focus on, is the green transition. The green transition and the use of renewable energy sources. And in essence, uh, renewable energy offers obviously many advantages. I can name very quickly cleaner air, Sources like wind and solar produce no pollutants, so they make uh, the air cleaner. Climate control, it obviously cuts down uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Innovative land of use, and we saw the examples of technologies like agrivoltaics, that they optimize land use, so benefiting both energy production and biodiversity. Habitat preservation and safety is another advantage. Water conservation, with renewables, we need less water than fossil fuels, so we save crucial resources for ecosystems and animals. And last but not least, sustainable energy, renewable sources ensure energy production without uh, exhausting resources. In uh, recent years, Greece has made um, a significant progress in, uh, in expanding its uh, renewable energy infrastructure. You heard yesterday the Greek Prime Minister uh, mentioning uh, the progress that Greece has made in that sector. According to studies, Greece is uh, second globally in the percentage of electricity generation from solar and wind. In uh, 2023, 57% of the energy mix was supplied by renewables. Uh, in 2022, the corresponding percentage was uh, 50%. Coal production was the lowest since 1970s. In um, 2023, that was also a record. Greece uh, didn't consume any coal power for uh, a couple of hours, 670 hours, which is 28 days. If you ask that a few years ago, that would be... Uh, scientific uh, fiction. And uh, in our national energy and climate plan, we have uh, set very ambitious targets towards uh, uh, renewable capacity additions. Uh, the renewables installed capacity target for 2030 is um, set at uh, 23.5 gigawatt, of which we have around 12 today of installed um, with uh, having 2050 the target of uh, 71 gigawatt. Lignite, as you know, will be phased out uh, by 2028. Capacity additions for 2030 uh, will be mostly driven by solar and uh, onshore wind, but at the same time, we expect capacity additions in uh, new technologies of batteries and uh, offshore wind. And we also invest a lot in uh, infrastructure, in uh, <clears throat> interconnections that aim to make Greece um, an international hub for clean energy and uh, support the decarbonization also of uh, the other regions. So our, today our investments uh, in uh, grids are three times more 
than wha what it was in 2019. And we are also working towards making our uh, Greek islands cleaner. I'm sure most of you, you love visiting uh, Greek islands. We have a large program. Um, its name is GR Echo Islands, the Greco Islands. It's a program that will actually turn all uh, Greek islands into beacons of uh, green energy and sustainability through custom-made, quite holistic interventions. We are currently working on uh, a new island, Poros Island, to transform it into uh, smart and green by implementing new technologies, having for the very first time, for example, an electric ferry uh, in Greece, small electric vehicles, um, driving electric and uh, waste management and other technologies. So to finish, to finish, my key message is that um, we need to solve the biodiversity crisis which I think is less appreciated threat to humanity. Uh, we need to solve these crises together with the climate crisis. Um, otherwise, there will be lost opportunities, uh, there will be expensive mistakes, I think, and um, even more extinctions. So the question, can we have a rapid uh, transition to renewables and save uh, at the same time, uh, biodiversity, it's not an easy answer. It doesn't have a clear uh, answer. Uh, and you know what? I often see this debate on, uh, on my office when uh, people, for example, come to visit me and they ask for me to, uh, to put a pause on the policies uh, to accelerate green transition. When they tell me, for example, that uh, Look, Alexandra, all these uh, solar panels um, on uh, agricultural land. Um, sooner or later, solar farms can uh, destroy native um, uh, vegetation. We won't have any more space to, to cultivate. That's an argument that I hear at the office. Uh, or wind farms that threaten flying animals, especially uh, those that migrate. Or that these, all these new infrastructure that we need for energy transition, uh, roads, power lines, uh, maybe new mines for extracting critical minerals. I also hear these arguments that they will uh, increase habitat loss or uh, fragmentation. But on the other hand, uh, it's obvious that renewable energy still positively impacts the climate and the air, and uh, uh, there is no other way. We need to accelerate uh, our green transition. Unfortunately, this is something that is well established in the mindsets of all European countries. And uh, as Greece is gifted with uh, a natural habitat of uh, extreme beauty and uh, diversity, both at land and uh, at sea, uh, I think that it's our duty to the next generations to, to protect it uh, to the best of our ability. And this is what we are doing as a Greek government. And I'm actually looking forward to hearing to this uh, toolbox, Euroelectric, um, which I think has a key role to play in protection of biodiversity. So thank you very much and happy to hear. Thanks, Alexandra. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so, yeah, let's hear the toolbox. Let's, let's find out what the plan is, what the ideas are. As you said, there's no easy solution, is there? Nothing at all. There, and there's no one, one size fits all. But we have with us today Johnny Miller. Johnny is the uh, technical lead for strategic biodiversity at the consultancy WSP. Put together the guidebook for us, this blueprint. Do you want to take a few minutes and take us through? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for having me here. Thank you for that um, amazing talk, Alexandra. And uh, you're right, this natural setting, I think, is really appropriate to the discussion today. The sun is shining, the wind is blowing, um, and it's a beautiful natural setting. So, yes, I, I work for WSP, large consultancy, really privileged to have worked with Euroelectric on this, on this project and with a number of other developers uh, and uh, other stakeholders. And power plants 2.0 uh, 
It's a practical resource for both industry and policymakers to help them accelerate renewable deployment while safeguarding biodiversity. So, and as I think you've set out, it is a much needed resource for us all. And again, just to reiterate some of the, the points that you made, so globally we are faced with these twin and interrelated threats of climate change and biodiversity loss, and the numbers are stark. WWF estimates that climate change has already resulted in over 4 trillion euros in economic losses to date, and a 70% loss of, uh, in wildlife populations since 1970. That is a dramatic change, and that is within the lifetime of many of you in the, in the room here today. So clearly, as you've said, renewables have a pivotal role in combating climate change. And in doing so, renewables can provide a significant benefit to biodiversity. Indeed, a renewables-based energy transition is predicted to result in 75% less risk to biodiversity and ecosystems, and 50% less climate-related loss and degradation of land. And that's all when compared to a fossil fuel business as usual. But a tripling of renewables capacity by 2030 uh, requires lots of development projects, which are not without risk to land cover and biodiversity. So Power Plant 2 presents a framework for ensuring that transition and these energy projects benefit biodiversity through good design and good implementation. The power sector is already doing much in this area. In developing this guidebook, we interviewed 10 developers, experts and stakeholders, surveyed another 20 Euroelectric members, and we also undertook extensive research of existing literature. And all of this research and uh, engagement identified many ways in which the power sector is already integrating biodiversity within their renewables projects. Our guidebook will showcase 15 of these uh, exemplary case studies from across Europe and across the five focal technologies uh, up on the, on the screen. So our work did highlight a number of common challenges affecting biodiversity integration. Again, uh, some of those have been mentioned uh, already. Conflicts between stakeholders, policy and land use priorities, potentially increased costs as a result of uh, this biodiversity premium, for example, from uh, requiring additional land purchases, a lack of common standards and language around biodiversity assessment, limiting assessment efficiencies and the ability to compare, perf compare performance. But it's also highlighted a number of exciting opportunities, including uh, de-risking projects from unforeseen costs and project delays, delivering additional environmental and social benefits from simp uh, uh, beyond simply biodiversity enhancements. And I think that's a really exciting uh, opportunity, trying to increase the efficiency of our land use. And also, uh, our renewable projects and all the research that goes into uh, developing them provides a, a really important source of data and knowledge that can help industry in general uh, and, uh, and the environment to improve performance. And many of these challenges and opportunities were raised uh, last night over dinner uh, with a number of the people I spoke to, um, so it's great to uh, have that validation. So on the back of this work and through a number of targeted workshops with Euroelectric uh, and their key stakeholders, our guidebook sets out a first-of-a-kind uh, set of guiding principles for biodiversity integration that addresses these challenges and realizes uh, many of these benefits. Mm -hmm. The guidebook and its principles are based on a range of existing international resources and developer approaches and were developed <coughs> to be applied throughout the project lifecycle, from uh, right at the beginning, uh, citing new developments, selecting those sites uh, and assessing their feasibility, through the design and permitting process, through construction, operation, all the way 
to decommissioning. So the guidebook sets out a number of principles, and uh, one of these is fundamental, and that is the uh, mitigation hierarchy, and really should be applied to all projects. The mitigation hierarchy is a tool for limiting biodiversity loss and achieving the best possible outcomes for biodiversity. It comprises four steps that can be followed, uh, that should be followed in order and to the fullest extent possible before moving to the next step. And this process is nicely illustrated, I think, by this graph. So at the start of the process, we have a negative predicted biodiversity impact depicted by this large green bar. The initial size of this bar um, de uh, describes the extent of possible impact. So a site of higher biodiversity value uh, uh, currently on its site will have a greater potential for adverse impacts and therefore a larger bar. The first step then is to avoid impacts as far as possible. And that is through uh, sensitive site selection, but also citing uh, the development activities sensitively within the development site. The next step is to minimize adverse impacts, for example, by scheduling the timing of development activities. And then where impacts cannot be prevented, we have uh, restoring or re-establishing what was lost or degraded as, as a result of the project. And then finally, uh, offsetting any residual impacts um, to achieve uh, either on or off site to achieve um, positive outcomes. The extent to which each of these steps can be applied and therefore the outcomes achieved will depend on a number of factors which are summarized here. But by using metrics, we can measure change and demonstrate measurable outcomes. <coughs> so as I said, we've got a number of principles, 12 principles, and we've, we can broadly group them together in three, uh, three groups. The first of these relates very closely to the mitigation hierarchy and sets out a sequential process of measuring change. It highlights, however, the importance of irreplaceable biodiversity, so those features that cannot be easily or at all recreated. The second group of principles uh, identifies the right biodiversity measures to be implemented for a particular project, taking account of the existing site characteristics and uh, local conservation pro priorities. So identifying additional biodiversity gains uh, informed by stakeholder uh, engagement and risk management. And then finally, the third group um, relates to information flows and long-term benefits. So these principles ensure that uh, projects transparently inform uh, and are informed by stakeholder engagement uh, and uh, industry best practice. All principles should be considered uh, at all stages of the project life cycle, um, and project proponents should evidence how they've been applied or justified where it's not been possible. And together, these represent best practice, um, a, pr a best practice approach to um, biodiversity integration. And, and we know that applying these principles can pay off. Um, and here's a great example of how applying the mitigation hierarchy can help to reduce potential losses and increased gains. You'll have seen this slide before, um, but imagine that is a, the, the top uh, graph is a higher baseline value site, biodiversity value site, with a larger initial green bar, so a larger potential uh, capacity for loss, versus a lower baseline site with a lower potential capacity for loss. So just locating our sites um, sensitively can reduce potential biodiversity loss and therefore um, uh, biodiversity impacts. And whilst, as I said before, the, um, the, the process and uh, potential for applying those different, um, uh, those different mitigation steps will vary depending on sites, if we apply the same uh, offset, um, amount of offset to two different sites with two different baselines, then we can achieve um, measurably different 
uh, different outcomes when we choose sites selectively and sensitively. In the guidebook, we set out practical actions for implementation um, at each of the project lifecycle stages. Um, today, I'm just going to give you a couple of examples. Um, and here we can see at the design and permitting stage, a project, um, a solar, farm, solar farm development that is designed through engagement with local stakeholders and uh, through undertaking appropriate surveys and research, identifies key features uh, to support those local populations. And those can then be, uh, uh, the site can then be arranged to, uh, to maintain those, those features and functions. But also, there's an opportunity there for achieving multiple benefits. So designing the site for those, uh, those features to provide visual screening or flood storage or other uh, functions. And then here at the operational phase, we've got a hydropower project. Um, the project could be implementing long-term uh, measures to support fish migration. Uh, at the same time, the operator continue, can continue to monitor performance over, over time, transparently report on the outcomes, uh, adapt measures where necessary, and share data and insights with industry so that we can all improve and learn from it. So that's what we've got within the Power Plant 2 uh, project that, um, report that will be coming out soon. And this is just a taster. Through this process, we identified uh, a number of uh, addi additional questions that industry and, um, uh, and regulators can work together to resolve. So here we have uh, a number of them there. So how to, how to finance this biodiversity premium, how to harmonize methodologies, and how to report most effectively. And finally, I want to invite you to the launch event uh, of Power Plant 2.0. Um, it's going to be uh, launched 13th of June in Brussels. You can scan the QR code to register, and I look forward to meeting some of you there. Thank you. Donnie, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That was really interesting. Thank you very much. Thanks. And uh, really good to get some examples as well. So I'm going to invite our, our, uh, our next guests up, and then we can have a discussion with the, with the whole room as well. So ladies and gentlemen, we're also on this panel going to bring up Eva Anna Bershev, the Senior Vice President for Development at Statcraft. Come and join us. Thank you very much. Uh, we also have... Hi. Lovely to have you there. Thank you. We also have Rebecca Humphreys, who is the Head of Climate Policy Europe at the Nature Conservancy. Thank you very much. Hi. Thanks, Rebecca. And we have Philippe Kunz, the Managing Director of Bewa Projects in Greece. Philippe, thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, it's good to have you all here. This is such an important topic, and it's really nice to sort of actually have a really engaged room with us as well. If you wouldn't mind getting out your phones for me, because I think at the very beginning of this discussion, it might be quite interesting to see how you all feel about biodiversity. So if we can go onto the first Slido for me, that would be fabulous. So there's going to be a QR code. There we go. I'll get out of the way for you. So this is going to take you to the first question. And if we launch the first question for you, it's the QR code on the side. I'd like to know what the room thinks here. How big a priority is biodiversity protection within the industry at the moment? So what do you think? How big a priority is it within the industry? While the audience is voting, what do you think? Philip, what do you think? How big a priority is it for the industry? Where would you think it would sit? There's a microphone just in front of you. Sorry. Yeah, it's on. Yeah. on. Hello, hello. Yes, you can hear me. Um, I would say somewhere between B and C. I think it's still okay. overshadowed. We need okay. to do more. All right. Oh, you, you think the industry is it's still over overshadowed? Okay. Rebecca, where do you think it is? Um, I, would, I would agree with Philip. Uh, yeah, between B and C. Okay. So you, it is on the agenda as far as you're concerned, but still overshadowed. Alexandra? 
Yes, it's true that uh, it needs to be done more, but at least I think that the industry has realized that this is absolutely crucial. Okay. So it's there, but more needs to be done. So maybe still overshadowed by other issues, maybe you, you would think, but it is there. Yeah. Okay. I think it's definitely got attention, but at the same time, these other topics are sort of overshadowing it. Yeah. And with the pace that we're moving, that is a concern. Okay, let's see how the room voted. So what does the room think? Yeah, look at that. Overshadowed by other issues. 14% it does not feature. Rebecca, what do you think about that? 14% of the room feel that it doesn't actually feature on the agenda. Um, well, at least it's the smallest uh, response. Very true, if yeah, we're, okay. If we're looking at things optimistically. <laughs> Um, I mean, I think reflecting on the on the past couple of days, we have heard a lot about um, the climate crisis, the need to decarb decarbonize. The biodiversity crisis hasn't featured yet. No. I think this is what this session is bringing into the mix. But so far, it hasn't come up as in, in terms of being one of the kind of overall issues. But I am encouraged to see that that is the smallest answer yeah. to, to that question. I, and I think, you know, what you've said is absolutely right because it's all about language and everyone is very used to talking about the climate crisis. But actually that word biodiversity is not necessarily always featuring. But I, I, I don't quite know if I... I don't, I don't quite agree. Okay. <laughs> We're a 130-year-old company um, doing purely renewables. It's 99.7% renewable in a good year. Um, and this topic has been, been there for quite some years for us. So in companies that has been around, has been doing operations and development, it has been increasing for years. But it's been much to specific species, and, and maybe more so on the hydropower side than on the wind power side. So I think it's, it's there, it's moving, it's regulated, it's, it's got attention, but my concern is more other issues given the pace yeah. and the impact that, yeah. that this increase, whether it is exponential or, or linear. So well, when, I, I, when you design your, your projects, your renewable ones, uh, how top is this criteria when, uh, I mean, uh, to safeguard, let's say, the, the area to protect whatever? Well, it, it actually does vary quite a lot with which country we're developing in. We're developing across Europe, uh, we're developing in Norway, we're developing in South America, in India, and it does differ. Mm? Yeah, because why? It, it, why? it depends also on the regulation, I it guess. It does how, depend how on the regulation. Yeah. 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 And before we go on to that, can we actually just go to the second question? Because this is going to be fascinating for you, because this mm. exactly sort of, uh, sort of, you know, plays into that. This is specifically about your organization, okay? So specifically mm -hmm. your company. So you, you, you would say absolutely. <laughs> so does your organization have plans to develop and implement a biodiversity strategy? Obviously, it's very difficult to have this as an industry-wide answer because you've chosen to be here, so you are already very interested, which may suggest that your company is. Um, so, I, I, okay, I was just going to go along the line, but I, I, I don't think that will help us. Let's get an answer on this one. Have we got some votes? Yeah, should we take an answer? Ah, okay. Yes, very yeah. ambition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Alexandra. I think that's the most real, realistic. Uh, it's positive, yes, because there is ambition, but uh, we need to see it from a, a tangible uh, outcome. And uh, we are not yet there. No, okay. Um, Eva, what, what do you think? Um, I think it's no ambition for a biodiversity strategy. It's... Um, 25%? Yeah. Do you want, who, who wants to come in on it? Do you want, do you want to come in on that? 25% with no ambition. Sure, yeah. I think, I think it's, you know, it's quite sad to hear that. Oh. On the other hand, I think what you've mentioned before, the, the need for speed at the moment you know, is overshadowing a lot of topics that would be very important. So I think this is the, the challenge of balancing things, communicating well, etc. We'll get to those points later in the discussion. I guess. Does anybody in the room who voted for no ambition, does anyone in the room feel comfortable enough to say 
why there's no ambition. I just mm -hmm. wonder, you know, we won't tell on you. <laughs> I won't ask you your company. But if anyone did vote that, and if they wanted to share why there was no ambition, then I'm happy to know. OK, I, I understand. I understand. Um, Rebecca, you've got a third of biodiversity strategy already been implemented. A, a third? Is that OK? Um, I mean, I think what, what's interesting about these results and, and bringing it to the project that we're here to discuss is it really shows the relevance of yeah. what we're trying to do here. So I think hopefully the guidebook is going to be helping those that, uh, you know, answered either A or B and can consolidate the efforts that those that answered uh, C uh, are doing. Okay, let's go on to the third question, if I may. Uh, again, if you wouldn't mind scanning the QR code for me. What? So what, in your opinion, is holding industry? Maybe you could answer this as your own company. What's, what's holding it back from further protecting biodiversity? What do we, uh, what do we, what do we think? Eva, what do you think the answer is going to be? What do you think it's going to be? Me? Yeah. I don't know. I'm sort of thinking um, D, as a matter of fact. You think D, knowledge yeah. and understanding. And also looping back to the previous question, which was that if anyone in the room says they have implemented a biodiversity strategy, I think that they'll find themselves having to change that or re-implement mm. because there's so much lack of regulation and so much knowledge missing if you compare this area to the to the decarbonization where you have you know conversion factors and nice spreadsheets and everything this is much more complicated mm. okay and important as well yeah um philippe what do you think is holding people back i would agree i think you know once you've started digging into that and you make it part of your development process i think it's actually much easier you know okay. it, the costs go down the understanding in the organization increases you start working with the local communities, with local nature conservancy um, organizations from the beginning. It is a bit more effort. What we saw, especially you know, in the early projects, is the cost was quite high, but as you learn, it comes down. And I think there is a benefit, but again, my, my big concern is, will we have the time to yeah. communicate that, to make people aware, and to you know, really, really roll it out across the industry, basically? Yeah, it, it, you know, that, that is a theme that's come up so many times over the last day and a half. It is the time and the speed. Let's see what the room thought. Whether it is not, oh, look at that. Over 50%, over half mm -hmm. of the room think it is the knowledge and understanding. So, good time for the guidebook. Oh, you to were right. Me, <laughs> to, be, to be coming out then. And um, I also think, allow me to say that for, for the industry to, to put a special focus on this sector, first, they need to take a, a signal from, a, from the state, from the government. If a state, a government, uh, puts uh, guidelines, principles, and um, gives the signal that this is a priority for, for the country, then I think uh, the industry follows and they abide by and they start thinking of it more seriously. Even that's, that is exactly what I, you said, I, I isn't absolutely it? absolutely agree. Yeah. And I think there's a, another key point in what you're saying is that uh, whatever we're doing at a, at a global or European perspective, it needs to be implemented and adapted locally and, and nationally. The, the nations are key in this work. Um, and then to the companies, I, I, you know, I can only, well, I got it right, as you said, or <laughs> we agree. Um, I think it's really important that we do get started and completely agree with Philip that we need to get it into the project processes. And then we need to work on, on the risk analysis and what we do with each individual project, um, because that's where the actual impact is. It's not, you know, somewhere else. It's in the project on the ground. Mm. So right, right from the very, very beginning and top down in as much as having the policies and the regulations. Absolutely. Maybe I, when I, after I uh, ended my first statement, something came to my mind. I mean, maybe despite the fact that we're going super fast and not everybody can implement these things in their project, maybe there's still hope because I think a lot of the measures can still be implemented at a later stage. So, I mean, of course, we should do our best to implement whatever we can now, but worst case, you know, going really fast, we can implement projects and then see, oh, damn, you know, in these projects we've done this, this was a great experience, let's add this here. It's a bit of a higher cost if you do it later on than in the process, but it can still be done. Mm. 
It'd be a positive note. Yeah, I, I, like, I like, like the positivity on this one. So lo lots of different things that we can talk about here. Um, I thought it, it, it might be nice to talk about um, the hierarchy and that the idea is that you start, the, the, the first thought must always be to start with, with the area that will have the least impact. So how do you get industry to have that mindset? Rebecca, how, how, how do you do that? How do you bring everything together so that, yes, it is the best thing to do, but it then becomes the easiest thing to do as well? Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, Johnny in his presentation um, mentioned something that's really key, which is from the very beginning, selecting those, uh, the, the smartest areas to do this renewable energy acceleration. Um, <coughs> sorry. Uh, so that's, that's something that the Nature Conservancy has been doing a lot of work on, trying to identify through our smart siting approach where the areas where there's the lowest uh, potential conflict with biodiversity, also with local communities. Um, we did a, a guide on this actually, uh, which if you want a copy, I can, I can uh, hand one out to you, which is basically what the methodology is for, for, for best selecting those areas. And then I think what's interesting about what the, the guidebook brings to the table is it's not just about avoiding um, impacts on biodiversity, it's how can we actively do good with these projects for biodiversity? How can we enhance biodiversity? And I think that's really the next step. And coming back to what you mentioned, I think that that point around having those positive incentives from policy is really key to now um, accelerating this and, 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 and making it the, the, the default. Yeah, so Alexandra, more incentives to choose the particular type of land from the very beginning? For me, the answer is um, it's all about working together. It's all about working together. For instance, you cannot just, uh, let's say, drop a huge offshore uh, wind farm on a community without talking to them uh, first. Uh, I think it's, it's a big mistake, for example, is if investors uh, don't engage with the community first, if they don't explain the benefits to people. Uh, and same goes for policymakers, because I, I represent uh, that side. So creating legislations without um, asking the market, for example, is a no-go. Um, and I think that everyone, investors, uh, policy makers, companies, communities, they need to work together. Um, and everyone has a role to play. Uh, governments, I think, should set clear policies. This is what the industry expects from us. Um, they also expect from us to provide financial support, incentives, as you mentioned, uh, subsidies, grants, whatever. Uh, I think that businesses uh, as well, they have to come with uh, new ideas, with um, new um, innovations, um, technologies. From the side of uh, banks and, uh, and investors, I think um, they need to support with uh, financial tools, uh, especially those projects that are sustainability related. Uh, also, I see public-private partnerships that they tend to become quite uh, effective. Uh, and let's not forget about civil society organizations, because as you mentioned, this is where the outcome uh, reaches. Um, I think that they raise awareness, they educate people. Uh, so to say it simply for me, collaboration, I think, is the most uh, important critical success uh, factor. Mm. Eva, you, you started nodding on uh, private-public partnerships. Well, I think I, I nodded all along. Um, yeah. I, I, I do believe all of what you're saying. Um, and then it's finding the balance in it. And what we see on the carbon side, right? Then we, now we see that the market for carbon-free new capacity yeah. is, is growing, right? So incentives are working. And I think we need more incentives than we need rules. We need more direction than harsh regulation and then we need to to really you know use the mitigation hierarchy the way it is thought mm -hmm. but i do i do want to raise and, and we do we have that implemented and sort of working in in the way that we think in in our company and we have it also implemented in i would say in the norwegian consenting regime where the mitigation hierarchy lives uh, heavily 
I do have one concern, though, on the mitigation hierarchy, and that is the offsetting. Okay. I think I, 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 I subscribe to the idea that you can do something good somewhere else for doing something bad in, in this one spot. I, I do agree. But it's, I see a lot of pitfalls and fallacies in, in this area if you start justifying doing really bad things by doing something good somewhere else. You, you would have a challenge doing conversions between marshlands and bird life. Uh, I do think this, this part of it is, is very challenging and, uh, and very important to get right. And to get it right, you need a, lo a lot more scientific evidence than we have on the planet today. <laughs> and you need a lot more knowledge into the regulatory authorities and into the, play into the, into the actors. So I really think, you know, as, as developers and operators, generators and grid operators, we really need to start acting fast on the first steps and then not run to the last step. Because if we create successful markets for mitigation, or excuse me, for offsetting, and, and don't pay attention to the first steps, I think we're on a slippery slope. Yeah, mm. so, so absolutely. That is the last thing that should ever be considered, or in fact, not even have that within the sphere at all. Philip, you wanted to come in on that one. Yes, absolutely, especially the first steps. I think if you take this topic really seriously, you really change your project development approach. Because usually you start from a very self-centric view, you go, you look at some sites, you say, this is the best one, let's go. But if you follow this approach, you really go engage with the local community, with the local mayors, with local environmental agencies to understand, okay, where, what is the impact of different sites? And on the one hand, it takes longer, it's more complicated, it's a higher effort. But on the other hand, I think from the beginning, you have a much higher level of local support, local buy-in, et cetera, et cetera, right? And this is why I'm so concerned about speed, because, you know, this is the trade-off that we need to make, basically. But um, I think this is the, the, the new approach that in an ideal world, you know, people would try more. And we've seen a huge change in Germany, for example, where... A lot of people, a lot of local communities were very much opposed, of course, against wind, but even starting against solar. But that has changed significantly with the crisis, with the Russian war, etc., where all of a sudden communities came to us and they said, we want to do something. What can we do together, basically? And then you have a completely different starting point. I mean, just following on from that, and we'll talk about the engagement with communities. You're talking about the speed uh, and maybe some challenges there. Can I just throw in perceived transparency as well from the industry towards communities? Because if you are moving at speed and there is, you know, we, we all know in the room there can be from communities this uh, uh, feeling that industry is not being transparent enough or politicians are not being transparent enough. That is a, a challenge that so many uh, industries have. How do you get over that? as industry or as politicians or as people working with industry? How do you do that? How do you get that trust with a community and the, the, the proper transparency? Who wants to come in on that? In my opinion, transparency, first of all, comes through a, a robust uh, framework. Uh, when the industry knows that there are clear rules there, uh, it needs to, to behave on a transparent way. And then the second issue for me is um, ethics, uh, morality. Uh, and this is very important as we talk about climate crisis and uh, uh, setting you know, the, the a positive outcome of uh, all these projects that we are talking related to energy transition because um, we need to show that with all these projects there is a social benefit ultimately apart from uh, uh, profit for the industry it, it must have ultimately a social benefit so it's a matter of uh, ethics as well. Yeah, Re Rebecca is nodding on this one. So, you know, what works when you're engaging with a community and, and how, do you, how do you lay out the whole process and get them involved right from the beginning? Yeah, I think this is, this is really the, you know, the, the crux of the, of the matter. And it, it, it's not easy because I don't think there's necessarily a kind of like a one-size-fits-all solution. Um, and then the concerns that communities have can be very different depending on 
the country, the circumstances, why they might be opposed to, to developments. So you have to take that into account. But I completely agree that transparency is key. Um, involving the uh, interested stakeholders from the very beginning, as early as possible. I think that can, can save uh, a lot of uh, troubles. Also, you know, shifting the narrative, I think, um, and th this is why I think this project is so interesting. It's really showing that, you know, renewables and biodiversity, that they're not in opposition. That's, that's an old narrative. We, you know, we, we can really show that they can go hand in hand and there can be benefits. And, and enhancements. Um, and then coming back to one of the things that you said earlier that really resonated, it's about working together. I think there's not one, you know, when we think about these uh, really big problems, existential threats from the climate and biodiversity crisis, there's not one sector or one stakeholder that's going to find the solution. We all need to work together and, and, and get better at working together to, to, to address these, uh, yeah. these issues. Okay, we are, we, we've got literally a, a, a minute left, um, and I'd like you all to give this room a thought. Uh, so we remember the graphs that we saw at the beginning when I asked the room if there was a strategy within their industry or how to implement that strategy. Give the room something that they can take away when they are either implementing a strategy or, 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 or trying to make one happen. Philippe, just a thought from you, very quick thought. Communication. I think we need to communicate a lot more, and not to the usual suspects, but especially to financiers, PPA off-takers, final investors. I think we have a couple of amazing clients and PPA off-takers who are really valuing these topics. And I think when it comes as a pull from those parties, you know, then it's a completely different uh, story. So think outside the box, think of everyone else that you, you, you need to bring together. Rebecca. Um, I think I'm going to go back to the, the point around policies and having the right incentives and rewards for, for these kind of projects. Um, I think that's what, what we need to see more of. Um, we need to use opportunities that are on the table, like the nature restoration law. You know, what are the opportunities that we can glean out of that and get that over the line? Um, so that's what I would, I would say. Alexandra. I think we should leave the room because we discussed today in this panel how renewables and green transition can go hand in hand or not with uh, uh, protecting biodiversity. And uh, I think we will agree that renewable energy can indeed be at the same time the most uh, cost effective solution, uh, but at the same time the most uh, friendly from a climate and biodiversity uh, perspective. And uh, I think that this is a direction also that we as uh, policy makers uh, must always keep at the forefront uh, of our minds when we design all these policies. I have to say, it's very lovely to hear you, you saying that in, in this room. And I, and I know uh, Johnny and the rest of the authors of the report will be very <laughs> pleased to hear you say that. Finally, Eva. Sure, thank you. I, I really hope the policy makers now work on the direction and the means, um, and then the industry needs to work on the tools and the measures. And then, for us in the industry, we, I think really we should work on the first steps in the mitigation hierarchy and try to really avoid using the last step before we have fully utilized the first steps. Good. It's a really, really good place to end it. Start with those first steps and, yeah, as what you're saying is you, don't, you shouldn't then need to even think about getting to the offset. Ladies and gentlemen, I really hope you've enjoyed this. The launch of the report is the 13th of June in Brussels. Uh, it is uh, during Renewable Energy Week. You may already uh, have that in your diary. And I believe there was an open invitation as well to, uh, to speak to the team and uh, uh, to, to see more about the report and to also uh, find out more about its launch. But please join me in thanking our expert guests. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.